421, chapters 28 and 29 of The Count of Monte Cristo. Book talk begins at 1809. Welcome to Craftlit. The podcast for crafters who love books. My name is Heather Ordover, and I'm podcasting from where the Delaware River meets the Old York Road, New Hope, Pennsylvania. Episode 421, I Like New York in June. This episode of Craftlet is brought to you by its listeners. Many thanks and much gratefulness to all of the listeners who have gone over to patreon.com slash craftlet and pledged their support to the show. We couldn't do it without you. Thank you. Well, hello. How are you? I hope you are well. I got back from a lovely time in New York City, and we had so much fun. I'll tell you, it's a lot more pleasant to go to New York City with a 16-year-old and a 12-year-old than it is, say, a six-year-old and a two-year-old. It was so much easier. (laughs) We had such a good time. We got to walk through Central Park. We got to go to the Museum of Natural History. We got to see the That's Too Big a Saurus. There, there's a dinosaur that is so big it cannot fit in one room. Now, admittedly, because the way the room was laid out with seating and everything, that's part of the reason that the dinosaur couldn't fit into one ginormous room. But my son pointed out that if they hadn't turned the dinosaur's skeleton's tail to the side and the neck to the side, that there's every possibility that stretched out straight, it actually wouldn't legitimately wouldn't have fit into one room. I will link to the titanosaur from the show notes because it is, it is quite something to see. And, and, and we started coming up with goofy names for everything. The that's too big a saurus was mine. We also got to watch a taping of the daily show. And I have never seen a show like this done. This was what my 16 year old wanted to do. And the taping is free. As long as you get there early, you go through a process. And I had to sign a waiver because he's 16 and that all worked out. But the thing that I found so interesting was that it was very much a production rather than a show. You were there, you watched the segments, you applauded, you did what they told you to do. But the thing that was fascinating was Trevor Noah. Now, I don't know if you watch The Daily Show. I don't know if you like The Daily Show. But Trevor Noah is someone to pay attention to. If you watch Comedians in Cars Getting Coffee, there is an episode that I will link to where Jerry Seinfeld and Trevor Noah go and get coffee. And I thought, well, sure, Jerry Seinfeld is jumping on the Trevor Noah bandwagon because he's the new host of The Daily Show, and that's just nifty. No, I was wrong. Jerry Seinfeld booked Trevor Noah onto Comedians in Cars Getting Coffee before Trevor Noah got The Daily Show gig. So I knew there was something interesting about him. And watching that episode of Comedians in Cars, he starts to talk about how he grew up in South Africa. Now, I was at UCLA during the end of apartheid when all of these protests were happening on campus about divesting from getting Coca-Cola to divest from its holdings in South Africa. And it was a a big to do. And eventually, thank God, apartheid ended. When I was up at my sister's in Syracuse with the baby, they had a a little baby warming party. (laughs) Welcome baby party. And one of the women at Syracuse University was from South Africa. And she and I were talking and I mentioned this episode of Trevor Noah. And she said, oh, as a South African, they're very aware of Trevor Noah. He's quite a name there as well. So he'd been on my mind and I was very, very curious to see what he was going to be like in person. And here's my takeaway. Trevor Noah is a funny guy, but mostly Trevor Noah seems to be a teacher because as he did his segments, and this was the day after Congress did nothing about guns. They didn't do anything positive or negative. Well, I guess doing nothing would count either as a positive or negative, depending on where you stand on that issue. But Congress did nothing. That's what they were reporting on. And in between segments, Trevor Noah went and got the microphone from the production assistant who was on the floor and turned to the audience and just talked about civics from the perspective of an outsider. Just looking, looking at how things work here, knowing how things worked there and reminding us 
of what an incredible and extraordinary gift we have in the United States of being able to have a voice in our government, but that we only have that voice in our government if we make our voices heard. And that protesting in the streets might not be the most effective way. Calling our congressmen and women is how these things get tracked. He said, tweeting doesn't count. Talking to your friends doesn't count. Protesting in the streets doesn't count. But if there's something you want to change, you call and you call every day and you make your voice heard that way. And that that's really right now in the United States, the only way we're going to have representative government. So I don't know about anywhere else in the United States, but I thought that was fascinating. Fascinating to have him as an outsider give his perspective, but also fascinating in that I hadn't really thought of it that way before. It's that outsider's perspective thing, right? Just like with Bram Stoker seeing Victorian London more clearly than writers who were born there. I just think it's so cool. And Trevor Noah was adorable too, on top of everything else. <sighs> Speaking of voting, thank you all so, so much for voting for Craftlet in the podcast awards. Uh, we didn't win, but the nomination was a big deal anyway, because there were thousands, I'm not joking, of podcasts that were nominated. So just for us to show up as one of the top 10 in the People's Choice Awards really, really means a lot to me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for going and doing the voting thing every day. More important than the podcast awards, though, is that we have our crafty chat back. So here we go with this week's bit of craftiness from Dawn and Erica and me. Here we go. So I have a few, a few somethings. First is I finished the pie shawl, the Yay. very simple garter stitch pie shawl. Oh, I like that. So for the people like at home, book. we've right. got burgundy, uh, a very clearly burgundy kind of a wine colored edge and then variegated colors going up. So which yarn was the rim and which yarn was the inner? Well, it's all one. It's one skein mm. of fresh from the cauldron Superwash gradient in the color exsanguinate. So that's the exsanguinate. Uh, Holy cow, that is amazing. That's a huge yeah. color change. Yeah, it's it's awesome. I love it. And I did it on size sevens. I usually knit fingering weight on a size six for shawls, but I tried it on a size seven to see how I liked it, and I really liked it. So it looks very open and do comfy. some other stuff than size sevens. You know, Father's Day wasn't normal, but he was, he got home around dinner time, and I asked him, you know, it's your day, what do you want? You want to go out? You want to order pizza? You want me to make something? And he said he wanted something, quote, with bacon and tater tots. And so I found this, like a classic man food recipe that had, it was called cheesy bacon tater tot pie. Oh my God. And pie is kind of a misnomer, but I, I did a double batch with two pounds of tater tots and more bacon than it said to use. And you know it's decadent when it's got cheese, mayonnaise, sour cream, bacon, and the secret ingredient in the sauce that goes on top, sriracha. So uh, mm. it was mood. quite a hit. Andrew and Abby, just between the two of them, ate two-thirds of a 9 by 13 pan of it. So I think that means it was good. Yeah, I'd so, say that's a score. So I will post the the link for that because that was easy. It was it's total man food or teenager food friendly. So that that was my my cooking. That's cool. And the, my last crafty thing I'm just blazing through this stuff today is tour de fleece. Tour yes. de fleece starts on the second, which is this. Saturday and goes through the 24th. And for those who have not heard of it, Tour de Fleece is modeled after the Tour de France bike race. And so it lasts many days with a few rest days and you make spinning goals for yourself and you spin every day that the bikers bike, you bike. And then when they rest, you rest and you have goals that you want to accomplish for it. And we here at Craftlet are too nutsy, busy to have our own team. So we are participating in Team Sasquatch, 
So on Ravelry, go join the Team Sasquatch group, which is a multi-podcast group. Um, That's started the, by the Knitmore Girls. The Knit Girls. I'm sorry. They started it years ago because I've been on Team Sas- Sasquatch for um, the Knit Olympics or uh, Ravel Olympics. What? Right, for everything. Yeah. The Ravelinic so Games it's, for years. So it's, it's Coggy from High Fiber Diet, the Knitmore Girls, just a bajillion different people. So come join us. Come join us. Oh, Crooked Knit says so she's uh, co-captaining a team, a Tour de Fleece team for her spinning guild this year. Ah. Yay. Um, oh, yes. And Megan from Stitch It. Yeah, all all different I eight, 8 million different podcasters. I didn't realize With that was gone. You know, a very exact term, 8 million. So my goal at this point is I'm, I'm keeping my goal very modest, is that I'm going to ply that 8 ounces of Be Myself singles that I had spun on the spindle. And I'm going to ply it on the spindle because I spun it on the spindle. So that's my very modest goal, achievable. Oh, and I just came back from New York. But I yes, don't want so to go there until you're. Seg- that's a good segue. It's it's now your turn. And I I hadn't realized the last time I tried to navigate New York City on my own with children, they were like six and two. And then oh, we we've, oh, we've come up oh. for thing two's birthday, but that's right. all of us together. And I haven't had to do it all all on my own. And I had nothing but boys for the whole Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and then we left kind of mid morning on Friday, and. It was just me and the boys, and I had the best time. I have some pictures, which I'll put on the show notes, that we just took We took fun pictures. We took our time. We didn't rush. It was June. It was beautiful, and it was warm, but it wasn't too humid, not like today, but we had a great time. We went to the Museum of Natural History. We got to see the That's Too Bigosaurus, which can't fit into one room. I have a picture of its head poking out into the hallway. Cause Seriously? We'd seen this when they first opened it. It's actually called the Titanosaur. It's new. They only recently found it. And it's a big deal. Ha ha. No pun intended. <laughs> no, but the thing is so enormous that thing to read, he read on a plaque, first off. That's new. But he read on a plaque that the thing wouldn't have been able to be displayed if it were actually the original bones. So it's not. It's 3D printed bones. Oh, my goodness. The entire gazillion bone skeleton. Uh, I have a gift from Nanette the nanny that she sent me. And oh, I'm... yeah, Nanette. Yes, I've seen that. Okay, so you have, to, you have to read it. And you have to read it in the right sing-songy kind of voice <laughs> for the people at home. All right. It is, I will knit on a boat. I will knit with a goat. I will knit in the train. I will knit in the rain. I will knit with a fox. I will knit in a box. I will knit with a mouse. I will knit in a house. I will knit here or there. I will knit everywhere. (laughs) And it's so cute. And all of the pictures, I hope, I hope. Dr. Seuss plus knitting. Yay. Yeah. You can't go wrong. All of the pictures are done like they're in knitting stitches. So. Oh, cool. I didn't realize that. Hi, this is Trisha from Massachusetts. I've been meaning to leave you this message forever. When you started doing The Count of Monte Cristo, the only thing I knew about the story was that I had seen a Simpsons episode of it. (laughs) So as we go along, I keep having moments where I'm like, oh, that's what they're referring to. Or, yep, it's just another Simpsons. But I thought that was funny, that it was my one reference to Count of Monte Cristo. And as the book has gone on, it has reminded me a lot of what was my favorite book in my 20s. It was the book Papillon, and then I'm drawing a blank now on who the author was, but it was written by, it was a memoir. And it is a, it was made into a movie by, and the main actor was your mom's favorite, who I'm drawing a blank on now. In the book, author is falsely accused of a crime. He is a petty criminal, but he didn't do this crime. And is sent off to a horrific prison in the northern part of South America. And it's all about life in the prison and trying to escape. And it is really compelling. It's a really good read. And so this is, re- hearing Count Monte Cristo is making me want to hear, read that again. 
And then one other book I wanted to bring to your attention because of all the talk about going to Paris, and that is Edward Rutherford's book, Paris. Now, I'll admit, I have not read this book by him yet, but I read London before I went to London, and I had also read, oh my gosh, he has one about Ireland, and he's got a bunch of them, and everyone that I've read has been fantastic, and they're all kind of like roots, but for European locations, um, you start following the family way back in history, and then it just goes generation after generation, and they're amazing. So I'm sure, based on my experience with London after reading London, that reading Paris before going to Paris will make it a whole different experience. All right. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Hey, Heather. This is Sarah Blake. Scarlet is on Ravelry and the internet in general. This past episode of The Count of Monte Cristo was really excellent, and I really loved hearing Caderousse's story. And one of the things that I loved about it was the uh, sort of way that it gave me more of a feel of what it must have been like to have lived in France at that time, especially like the time of Napoleonic Wars and like the all the intrigue and, and politics that you don't normally get in like a history class. So that was really cool. And that's just been really one of my favorite parts of the book is just getting a feel for that world and a feel for the political climate. The other thing that I wanted to talk about was when you were talking about the, the cochineal and the indigo, it reminded me of this excellent, excellent book that I read years ago about different dyes and paints, and it's called Color by Victoria Finlay. And there seem to be a few different editions. It looks like there's a UK edition and a U.S. edition, and the U.S. edition is subtitled A Natural History of the Palette, and the U.K. edition is spelled with a U, of course, and is subtitled Travels Through the Paint Box. So I just wanted to recommend that book. It's a really excellent thing for anybody who is interested in, like, the history of how different paints and dyes were made, or anybody who likes a good travel log, because it's also, like, all about these different places that she visited and did her research on the different paints um, and the different dyes. And, oh, one thing from that book, uh, you were talking about Wode and how they would put it on their skin in battle. And apparently one of the reasons for that is that it's an antiseptic. And so, like, it was good for intimidating your enemies, and it also was good for if you got injured, like, you wouldn't immediately, or you wouldn't, you would be less likely to die from infection. So yeah, that's all. Thanks for doing what you do. Love it a lot. Have a good one. Bye. (laughs) So craftiness aside, we have a couple of chapters we need to get on to. Today we're doing chapters 28 and 29. And last episode, we finished up our meeting between the Abbe and Caderousse. Now, we can tell that the Abbe is, in fact, Edmund Dantes, in his new guise as not Edmund and not the Count, but as Abbe Busconi. Now, one of the things I've been trying to find out is if this story, in its original serialized form, was called The Count of Monte Cristo. Because if so, that means that original readers, just like us, were waiting for the Count to show up. And is it, is it this chapter? Is it next chapter? When are we going to see him? Well, the answer is we haven't yet, and we might soon. But today, we leave Caderousse, and we have some other unfinished business that Edmund, the older and wiser version, needs to go in and do some research on. And so the first chapter today is going to be part of the research. The second chapter today doesn't look like it, but it too is research. There are several terms that I wanted to clarify with you because they're used strangely. And I went back to the new translation and I went back to the French and they're actually translated pretty well. So it's, it's not that it's just a usage thing. Eulogium 
is something that you just don't hear very often. But like eulogy, it's praise that's given to someone. Phlegmatic is, in this case, referring to someone who is calm, not someone who is meek necessarily, but someone who is naturally very calm. You will hear a reference to someone laughing at the ends of their teeth. In French, it was the tips of their teeth, but I think what they're getting at is clenched teeth. So that's something just to keep in mind when you hear someone being referred to as laughing at the tips of their teeth. That's what it is. Plate is another term for silverware, real silver, silverware, not plated silver, but actual real silver was referred to as plate. The name or nickname, cocle, is C-O-C-L-E-S. This goes back to Latin. Well, it's a Frenchified version of a Latin term that goes way back into ancient times. And it is a name given to someone who lost the use of an eye. In the original case that I found, it was losing an eye in battle. But it's a kind of a nickname for someone who's one-eyed, which is kind of eh, but it goes way back. The last thing is nankin trousers. These were the flat front kind of taupe colored trousers. I always think of Darcy in trousers like this. They often had the little strap that went under the foot to keep them very tucked in. And they often had this little strap that went under the foot to keep the trouser down and close to the ankle. Men would have worn black shoes, not necessarily boots, but black shoes with them. And I will link to a picture in the show notes so you can take a look at what they look like. And then you'll go, oh yeah, those, (laughs) which is pretty much exactly what I did. And I think that's it. We've got two chapters. So let's hop to it. Here we go with chapters 28 and 29 of The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandre Dumas, read for us by David Clark. Chapter 28. The Prison Register. The day after that, in which the scene we have just described had taken place, on the road between Bellegarde and Beaucaire, a man of about thirty or two and thirty, dressed in a bright blue frock coat, nankeen trousers and a white waistcoat, having the appearance and accent of an Englishman, presented himself before the mayor of Marseille. Sir, said he, I am chief clerk of the House of Thompson and French of Rome. We are, and have been these ten years, connected with the House of Morel and Son of Marseille. We have a hundred thousand francs, or thereabouts, loaned on their securities, and we are a little uneasy at reports that have reached us, that the firm is on the brink of ruin. I have come, therefore, express from Rome, to ask you for information. Sir, replied the mayor, I know very well that during the last four or five years misfortune has seemed to pursue Monsieur Morel. He has lost four or five vessels and suffered by three or four bankruptcies, but it is not for me, although I am a creditor myself, to the amount of ten thousand francs, to give any information as to the state of his finances. Ask of me as mayor what is my opinion of Monsieur Morel, and I shall say that he is a man honourable to the last degree and who has up to this time fulfilled every engagement with scrupulous punctuality. This is all I can say, sir. If you wish to learn more, address yourself to Monsieur de Beauville, the inspector of prisons, number 15, rue de Noailles. He has, I believe, 200,000 francs in Morel's hands. And if there be any grounds for apprehension, as this is a greater amount than mine, you will most probably find him better informed than myself. The Englishman seemed to appreciate this extreme delicacy, made his bow and went away, proceeding with a characteristic British stride towards the street mentioned. Monsieur de Beauville was in his private room, and the Englishman, on perceiving him, made a gesture of surprise which seemed to indicate that it was not the first time he had been in his presence. As to Monsieur de Beauville, He was in such a state of despair that it was evident all the faculties of his mind, absorbed in the thought which occupied him at the moment, did not allow either his memory or his imagination to stray to the past. 
The Englishman, with the coolness of his nation, addressed him in terms nearly similar to those with which he had accosted the mayor of Marseille. "'Oh, sir!' exclaimed Monsieur de Beauville, "'your fears are unfortunately but too well founded, "'and you'll see before you a man in despair. "'I had two hundred thousand francs placed in the hands of Morel and Son. "'These two hundred thousand francs were the dowry of my daughter, "'who was to be married in a fortnight, "'and these two hundred thousand francs were payable "'half on the fifteenth of this month "'and the other half on the fifteenth of next month.' I had informed Monsieur Morel of my desire to have these payments punctually, and he has been here within the last half hour to tell me that if his ship, the Pharaon, did not come into port on the 15th, he would be wholly unable to make this payment. But, said the Englishman, this looks very much like a suspension of payment. It looks more like bankruptcy, exclaimed Monsieur de Beauville despairingly. The Englishman appeared to reflect a moment, and then said, "'From which it would appear, sir, that this credit inspires you with considerable apprehension. "'To tell you the truth, I consider it lost. "'Well, then, I will buy it of you.' "'You?' "'Yes, I. "'But at a tremendous discount, of course. "'No, for two hundred thousand francs. "'Our house.' added the Englishman with a laugh, does not do things in that way. And you will pay? Ready money. And the Englishman drew from his pocket a bundle of banknotes which might have been twice the sum Monsieur de Beauville feared to lose. A ray of joy passed across Monsieur de Beauville's countenance, yet he made an effort at self-control and said, Sir, I ought to tell you that in all probability you will not realize six per cent of this sum. "'That's no affair of mine,' replied the Englishman. "'That is the affair of the house of Thompson and French, in whose name I act. "'They have, perhaps, some motive to serve in hastening the ruin of a rival firm. "'But all I know, sir, is that I am ready to hand you over this sum "'in exchange for your assignment of the debt. "'I only ask a brokerage.' "'Of course, that is perfectly just,' cried Monsieur de Beauville. The commission is usually one and a half. Will you have two, three, five per cent, or even more? Whatever you say. Sir, replied the Englishman, laughing, I am like my house, and do not do such things. No, the commission, I ask, is quite different. Name it, sir, I beg. You are the inspector of prisons. I have been so these fourteen years. You keep the registers of entries and departures. I do. To these registers, there are added notes relative to the prisoners. There are special reports on every prisoner. Well, sir, I was educated at home by a poor devil of an abbe who disappeared suddenly. I have since learned that he was confined in the Chateau d'If, and I should like to learn some particulars of his death. What was his name? The Abbe Faria. Oh, I recollect him perfectly, cried Monsieur de Beauville. He was crazy. Uh, so they said. Oh, he was decidedly. Uh, very possibly. But what sort of madness was it? He pretended to know of an immense treasure and offered vast sums to the government if they would liberate him. Poor devil! And he is dead? Yes, sir, five or six months ago, last February. You have a good memory, sir, to recollect dates so well. I recollect this because the poor devil's death was accompanied by a singular incident. Uh, may I ask what that was? said the Englishman with an expression of curiosity, which a close observer would have been astonished at discovering in his phlegmatic countenance. Oh, dear sir, yes, the abbe's dungeon was forty or fifty feet distant from that of one of Bonaparte's emissaries, one of those who had contributed the most to the return of the usurper in 1815, a very resolute and very dangerous man. Indeed, said the Englishman. Yes, replied Monsieur de Beauville, 
I myself had occasion to see this man in 1816 or 1817, and we could only go into his dungeon with a file of soldiers. That man made a deep impression on me. I shall never forget his countenance. The Englishman smiled imperceptibly. And you say, sir, he interposed, that the two dungeons were separated by a distance of fifty feet. But it appears that this Edmond Dante, this dangerous man's name was Edmond Dante. It appears, sir, that this Edmond Dante had procured tools or made them, for they found a tunnel through which the prisoners held communication with one another. This tunnel was dug, no doubt, with an intention of escape. No doubt, but unfortunately for the prisoners, the Abbe Faria had an attack of catalepsy and died. That must have cut short the projects of escape. For the dead man, yes, replied Monsieur de Beauville, but not for the survivor. On the contrary, this Dante saw a means of accelerating his escape. He no doubt thought that the prisoners had died in the Chateau d'If were interred in an ordinary burial ground, and he conveyed the dead man into his own cell, took his place in the sack in which they had sewed up the corpse, and awaited the moment of interment. It was a bold step, and one that showed some courage, remarked the Englishman. As I have already told you, sir, he was a very dangerous man, and, fortunately, by his own act, disembarrassed the government of the fears it had on his account. How was that? How? Do you not comprehend? No. The Chateau d'If has no cemetery, and they simply threw the dead into the sea, after fastening a thirty-six pound cannonball to their feet. Well, observed the Englishman as if he was slow of comprehension, well, they fastened a thirty-six pound ball to his feet, and throw him into the sea. Really? exclaimed the Englishman. Yes, sir, continued the inspector of prisons. You may imagine the amazement of the fugitive when he found himself long headlong over the rocks. I should like to have seen his face at that moment. That would have been difficult. No matter, replied de Beauville, in supreme good humour, at the certainty of recovering his two hundred thousand francs. No matter. I can fancy it, and he shouted with laughter. So can I, said the Englishman, and he laughed too, but he laughed as the English do, at the end of his teeth. And so, continued the Englishman, who first gained his composure, he was drowned. Unquestionably. So that the governor got rid of the dangerous and the crazy prisoner at the same time. Precisely. "'But some official document was drawn up to this affair, I suppose?' inquired the Englishman. "'Yes, yes, the mortuary deposition. You understand that Dante relations, if he had any, might have some interest in knowing if he were dead or alive. So that now, if there was anything to inherit from him, they may do so with easy conscience. He is dead, and no mistake about it.' "'Oh, yes,' and they may have the fact attested whenever they please. So be it, said the Englishman. But to return to these registers. True, this story has diverted our attention from them. Excuse me. Excuse you for what? For the story? By no means. It really seems to me very curious. Yes, indeed so, sir. You wish to see all relating to the poor abbe, who really was gentleness itself? Yes, sir, you will much oblige me. Go into my study here, and I will show it to you. And they both entered Monsieur de Beauville's study. Everything was here arranged in perfect order. Each register had its number, each file of papers its place. The inspector begged the Englishman to seat himself in an armchair and place before him the register and documents relative to the Chateau d'If, giving him all the time he desired for the examination while de Beauville seated himself in a corner and began to read his newspaper. The Englishman easily found the entries relative to the Abbe Faria. 
but it seemed that the history which the inspector had related interested him greatly, for after having perused the first documents, he turned over the leaves until he reached the deposition respecting Edmond Dante. There he found everything arranged in due order. The accusation, examination, Morel's petition, Monsieur de Villefort's marginal notes. He folded up the accusation quietly and put it as quietly in his pocket, read the examination and saw that the name of Noirtier was not mentioned in it, perused to the application dated 10th April 1815, in which Morel, by the deputy procureur's advice, exaggerated with the best intentions, for Napoleon was then on the throne, the services Dante had rendered to the imperial cause, services which Villefort's certificates rendered indispensable. Then he saw through the whole thing. This petition to Napoleon, kept back by Villefort, had become, under the second restoration, a terrible weapon against him in the hands of the king's attorney. He was no longer astonished when he searched on to find in the register this note, placed in a bracket against his name. Edmond Dante, an inveterate Bonapartist, took an active part in the return from the island of Elba, to be kept in strict solitary confinement, and to be closely watched and guarded. Beneath these lines was written in another hand, See note above, nothing can be done. He compared the writing in the bracket with the writing of the certificate placed beneath Morel's petition, and discovered that the note in the bracket was the same writing as the certificate. That is to say, was in Villefort's handwriting. As to the note which accompanied this, the Englishman understood that it might have been added by some inspector who had taken a momentary interest in Dante's situation, but who had, from the remarks we have quoted, found it impossible to give any effect to the interest he had felt. As we have said, the inspector, from discretion, and that he might not disturb the Abbe Faria's pupil in his researches, had seated himself in a corner and was reading Le Drapeau Blanc. He did not see the Englishman fold up and place in his pocket the accusation written by Donglard under the arbour of La Reserve, and which had the postmark Marseille, 27th February, delivery 6 o'clock p.m. But it must be said that if he had seen it, he attached so little importance to this scrap of paper, and so much importance to his 200,000 francs, that he would not have opposed whatever the Englishman might do, however irregular it might be. Thanks, said the latter, closing the register with a slam. I have all I want. Now it is for me to perform my promise. Give me a simple assignment of your debt. Acknowledge therein the receipt of the cash, and I will hand you over the money. He rose, gave his seat to Monsieur de Beauville, who took it without ceremony, and quickly drew up the required assignment, while the Englishman counted out the banknotes on the other side of the desk. End of chapter 28「Chapter 29. The House of Morel and Son » Anyone who had quitted Marseille a few years previously, well acquainted with the interior of Morel's warehouse, and had returned at this date, would have found a great change. Instead of that air of life, of comfort, and of happiness that permeates a flourishing and prosperous business establishment, instead of merry faces at the windows, busy clerks hurrying to and fro in the long corridors, instead of the court filled with bales of goods, re-echoing with the cries and the jokes of porters, one would have immediately perceived all aspect of sadness and gloom. Out of all the numerous clerks that used to fill the deserted corridor and the empty office, but two remained. One was a young man of three or four and twenty who was in love with Monsieur Morel's daughter, and had remained with him in spite of the efforts of his friends to induce him to withdraw. The other was an old one-eyed cashier called Cocle, or Cockeye, a nickname given him by the young men who used to throng this vast, now almost deserted beehive, and which had so completely replaced his real name that he would not in all probability have replied to anyone who addressed him by it. Cochle remained in Monsieur Morel's service, and a most singular change had taken place in his position. He had at the same time risen to the rank of cashier, and sunk to the rank of a servant. 
He was, however, the same Cocle, good, patient, devoted, but inflexible on the subject of arithmetic, the only point on which he would have stood firm against the world, even against Monsieur Morel, and strong in the multiplication table which he had at his fingers' ends, no matter what scheme or what trap was laid to catch him. In the midst of the disasters that befell the house, Cocle was the only one unmoved. But this did not arise from a want of affection, on the contrary, from a firm conviction. Like the rats that one by one forsake the doomed ship even before the vessel weighs anchor, so all the numerous clerks had by degrees deserted the office and the warehouse. Cocle had seen them go without thinking of inquiring the cause of their departure. Everything was, as we have said, a question of arithmetic to Cocle, and during twenty years he had always seen all payments made with such exactitude that it seemed as impossible to him that the house should stop payment as it would to a miller that the river that had so long turned his mill should cease to flow. Nothing had as yet occurred to shake Cockler's belief. The last month's payment had been made with the most scrupulous exactitude. Cockler had detected an overbalance of fourteen sous in his cash, and the same evening he had brought them to Monsieur Morel, who, with a melancholy smile, threw them into an almost empty drawer, saying, Thanks, Cockler. You are the pearl of cashier. Cockler went away perfectly happy for this eulogium of Monsieur Morel himself, the pearl of the honest men of Marseille, flattered him more than a present of fifty crowns. But since the end of the month, Monsieur Morel had passed many an anxious hour. In order to meet the payments then due, he had collected all his resources, and, fearing lest the report of his distress should get bruited abroad at Marseille, when he was known to be reduced to such an extremity. He went to the Beaucaire Fair to sell his wife's and daughter's jewels and a portion of his plate. By this means the end of the month was past, but his resources were now exhausted. Credit, owing to the reports afloat, was no longer to be had, and to meet the 100,000 francs due on the tenth of the present month, and the 100,000 francs due on the 15th of the next month to Monsieur de Beauville, Monsieur Morel had, in reality, no hope but the return of the Pharaon, of whose departure he had learned from a vessel which had weighed anchor at the same time, and which had already arrived in harbour. But this vessel, which, like the Pharaon, came from Calcutta, had been in for a fortnight, while no intelligence had been received of the Pharaon. Such was the state of affairs, when the day after his interview with Monsieur de Beauville, the confidential clerk of the house of Thompson and French of Rome presented himself at Monsieur Morel's. Emmanuel received him. This young man was alarmed by the appearance of every new face, for every new face might be that of a new creditor, come in anxiety to question the head of the house. The young man, wishing to spare his employer the pain of this interview, questioned the newcomer. But the stranger, declared that he had nothing to say to Monsieur Emmanuel, and that his business was with Monsieur Morel in person. Emmanuel sighed, and summoned Cocle. Cocle appeared, and the young man bade him conduct the stranger to Monsieur Morel's apartment. Cocle went first, and the stranger followed him. On the staircase they met a beautiful girl of sixteen or seventeen, who looked with anxiety at the stranger. Monsieur Morel is in his room, is he not, Mademoiselle Julie? said the cashier. Yes, I think so, at least, said the young girl hesitatingly. Go and see, Cocle, and if my father is there, announce this gentleman. It will be useless to announce me, Mademoiselle, returned the Englishman. Monsieur Morel does not know my name. This worthy gentleman has only to announce the confidential clerk of the house of Thompson and French of Rome with whom your father does business. The young girl turned pale and continued to descend while the stranger and Cockler continued to mount the staircase. She entered the office where Emmanuel was, while Cockler, by the aid of a key he possessed, opened a door in the corner of a landing place on the second staircase, conducted the stranger into an antechamber, opened a second door, which he closed behind him, and after having left the clerk of the house of Thompson and French alone, returned and signed to him that he could enter. 
The Englishman entered and found Morel seated at a table, turning over the formidable columns of his ledger, which contained the list of his liabilities. At the sight of the stranger, Monsieur Morel closed the ledger, arose and offered a seat to the stranger, and when he had seen him seated, resumed his own chair. Fourteen years had changed the worthy merchant, who in his thirty-sixth year, at the opening of this history, was now in his fiftieth. His hair turned white, time and sorrow had ploughed deep furrows in his brow, and his look, once so firm and penetrating, was now irresolute and wandering, as if he feared being forced to fix his attention on some particular thought or person. The Englishman looked at him with an air of curiosity, evidently mingled with interest. Monsieur, said Morel, whose uneasiness was increased by this examination, you wish to speak to me? Yes, monsieur. You are aware from whom I come. The house of Thompson and French, at least, so my cashier tells me. He has told you rightly. The house of Thompson and French had 300,000 or 400,000 francs to pay this month in France, and knowing your strict punctuality, have collected all the bills bearing your signature, and charged me as they became due to present them, and to employ the money otherwise. Morel sighed deeply, and passed his hand over his forehead, which was covered with perspiration. So then, sir, said Morel, you hold bills of mine? Yes, and for a considerable sum. What is the amount? asked Morel, with a voice he strove to render firm. Here is said the Englishman, taking a quantity of papers from his pocket, an assignment of 200,000 francs to our house by a Monsieur de Beauville, the inspector of prisons, to whom they are due. You acknowledge, of course, that you owe this sum to him. Yes, he placed the money in my hands at four and a half per cent, nearly five years ago. When are you to pay? Half the 15th of this month, half the 15th of next just so. And now here are 32,500 francs payable shortly. They are all signed by you, and assigned to our house by the holders. I recognize them, said Morel, whose face was suffused as he thought that for the first time in his life he would be unable to honor his own signature. Is this all? No, I have for the end of the month these bills which have been assigned to us by the house of Pascal and the house of Wild and Turner of Marseille, amounting to nearly 55,000 francs in all, 287,500 francs. It is impossible to describe what Morel suffered during this enumeration. 287,500 francs, repeated he. Yes, sir, replied the Englishman. I will not, continued he after a moment's silence, conceal from you that while your probity and exactitude up to this moment are universally acknowledged, yet the report is current in Marseille that you are not able to meet your liabilities. At this almost brutal speech, Morel turned deathly pale. Sir, said he, up to this time, and it is now more than four and twenty years since I received the direction of this house from my father, who had himself conducted it for five and thirty years. Never has anything bearing the signature of Marilyn's son been dishonored. I know that, replied the Englishman, but as a man of honor should answer another, tell me fairly, shall you pay these with the same punctuality? Morel shuddered and looked at the man who spoke with more assurance than he had hitherto shown. Two questions, frankly put, said he. A straightforward answer should be given. Yes, I shall pay if, as I hope, my vessel arrives safely, for its arrival will again procure me the credit which the numerous accidents of which I have been the victim have deprived me. But if the pharaoh should be lost... And this last resource begun? The poor man's eyes filled with tears. Well, said the other, if this last resource fail you... Well, 
returned Morel. It is a cruel thing to be forced to say, but already used to misfortune, I must habituate myself to shame. I fear I shall be forced to suspend payment. Have you no friends who could assist you? Morel smiled mournfully. In business, sir, said he, one has no friends, only correspondence. It is true, murmured the Englishman. Then you have but one hope. But one. The last? The last. So that if this fail, I am ruined, completely ruined. As I was on my way here, a vessel was coming into port. I know it, sir. A young man who still adheres to my fallen fortunes passes a part of his time in a belvedere at the top of the house in hopes of being the first to announce good news to me. He has informed me of the arrival of this ship. And it is not yours? No. She is a Bordeaux vessel, La Gironde. She comes from India also, but she is not mine. Perhaps she has spoken to the pharaoh and brings you some tidings of her. Shall I tell you plainly one thing, sir? I dread almost as much to receive any tidings of my vessel as to remain in doubt. Uncertainty is still hope. Then in a low voice, Morel added, This delay is not natural. The pharaoh left Calcutta the 5th of February. She ought to have been here a month ago. What is that? said the Englishman. What is the meaning of that noise? Oh, oh, cried Morel, turning pale. What is it? A loud noise was heard on the stairs of people moving hastily and half-stifled sobs. Morel rose and advanced to the door, but his strength failed him, and he sank into a chair. The two men remained opposite one another, Morel trembling in every limb, the stranger gazing at him with an air of profound pity. The noise had ceased, but it seemed that Morel expected something. Something had occasioned the noise, and something must follow. The stranger had fancied he heard footsteps on the stairs, and that the footsteps, which were those of several persons, stopped at the door. A key was inserted in the lock of the first door, and the creaking of hinges was audible. "'There are only two persons who have the key to that door,' murmured Morel. "'Cocle and Julie.' At this instant, the second door opened, and the young girl, her eyes bathed with tears, appeared. Morel rose tremblingly, supporting himself by the arm of the chair. He would have spoken, but his voice failed him. "'Oh, father,' said she, clasping her hands, "'forgive your child for being the bearer of evil tidings.' Morel again changed colour. Julie threw herself into his arms. "'Oh, father, father!' murmured she. "'Courage!' "'The fair one has gone down, then,' said Morel in a hoarse voice. The young girl did not speak, but she made an affirmative sign with her head as she lay on her father's breast. "'And the crew?' asked Morel. "'Saved,' said the girl. "'Saved by the crew of the vessel that has just entered the harbour. Morel raised his two hands to heaven with an expression of resignation and sublime gratitude. "'Thanks, my God,' said he. "'At least thou strikest but me alone.' A tear moistened the eye of the phlegmatic Englishman. "'Come in, come in,' said Morel, "'for I presume you are all at the door.' Scarcely had he uttered these words, the Madame Morel entered weeping bitterly. Emmanuel followed her, and in the antechamber were visible the rough faces of seven or eight half-naked sailors. At the sight of these men, the Englishman started and advanced a step, then restrained himself and retired into the farthest and most obscure corner of the apartment. Madame Morel sat down by her husband and took one of his hands in hers. Julie still lay with her head on his shoulder, Emmanuel stood in the centre of the chamber and seemed to form the link between Morel's family and the sailors at the door. "'How did this happen?' said Morel. 
Draw nearer, Penelon, said the young man, and tell us all about it. An old seaman, bronzed by the tropical sun, advanced, twirling the remains of a tarpaulin between his hands. Good day, Monsieur Morel, said he, as if he had just quitted Marseille the previous evening and had just returned from Aix or Toulon. Good day, Penelon, returned Morel, who could not refrain from smiling through his tears. Where is the captain? The captain, Monsieur Morel. He has stayed behind the sick at Palma. But, please God, it won't be much, and you will see him in a few days, all alive and hearty. Well, now, tell your story, Penelon. Penelon rolled his quid in his cheek, placed his hand before his mouth, turned his head and sent a long jet of tobacco juice into the antechamber, advanced his foot, balanced himself, and began. Yeah, you see, Monsieur Morel, said he, uh, we were somewhere between uh, Cape Blanc and Cape Boyadar, sailing with a fair breeze, south-south-west after a week's calm, when Captain Gomar comes up to me. I was at the helm, I should tell you, and says, Penelon, what do you think of those clouds coming up over there? I was just then looking at them myself. What do I think, Captain? Oh, I think they are rising faster than they have any business to do, and that they would not be so black if they didn't mean mischief. That's my opinion, too, said the captain, and I'll take precautions accordingly. We are carrying too much canvas. Avast there, all hands. Take in the studding sails and stow the flying jib. It was time. The squall was on us and the vessel began to yield. Ah, said the captain, we have still too much canvas set. All hands lower the mains. Five minutes after, it was down, and we sailed under mizzen topsails and top gallant sails. Well, Penelon, said the captain, what makes you shake your head? Why, I says, I still think you've got too much on. I think you're right, answered he. We shall have a gale. A gale? More than that, we shall have a tempest, or I don't know what's what. You could see the wind coming, like the dust at Montredon. Luckily, the captain understood his business. Take in two reefs in the topsails, cried the captain. Let go the bowlins, haul the brace. Lower the gallant sails, haul out the reef tackles on the yards. That was not enough for those latitudes, said the Englishman. I should have taken four reefs in the top sails and furled the spanker. His firm, sonorous and unexpected voice made everyone start. Penelon put his hand over his eyes and then stared at the man who thus criticised the manoeuvres of his captain. We did better than that, sir, said the old sailor respectfully. We put the helm up to run before the tempest. Ten minutes after we struck our topsails and scudded under bare poles. The vessel was very old to risk that, said the Englishman. Eh, it was that that did the business after pitching heavily for twelve hours. We sprung a leak. Penelon, said the captain, I think we are sinking. Give me the helm and go down into the hold. I gave him the helm and descended. There was already three feet of water. All hands to the pumps, I shouted. But it was too late. And it seemed the more we pumped, the more came in. Ah, said I, after four hours' work, since we are sinking, let us sink. We can die but once. That's the example you set, Penelon, cries the captain. Very well, wait a minute. He went into his cabin and came back with a brace of pistols. I will blow the brains out of the first man who leaves the pump, said he. Well done, said the Englishman. There's nothing gives you so much courage as good reasons, continued the sailor. And during that time, 
the wind had abated, and the sea gone down. But the water kept rising, not much, only two inches an hour, but still it rose. Two inches an hour does not seem much, but in twelve hours that makes two feet, and three we had before that makes five. Come, said the captain, we have done all in our power, and Monsieur Morel will have nothing to reproach us with. We have tried to save the ship. Let us now save ourselves. To the boats, my lads, as quick as you can. Now, continued Penelon. You see, Monsieur Morel, a sailor is attached to his ship, but still more to his life. So we did not wait to be told twice. The more so that the ship was sinking under us and seemed to say, Get along, save yourselves. We soon launched the boat, and all eight of us got into it. The captain descended last, or rather, he did not descend, he would not quit the vessel, so I took him round the waist and threw him into the boat, and then I jumped after him. It was time, for just as I jumped the deck, burst with a noise like the broadside of a man of war. Ten minutes after, she pitched forward, then the other way, spun round and round, and then goodbye to the pharaoh. As for us, we were three days without anything to eat or drink, so that we began to think of drawing lots, who should feed the rest, when we saw La Gironde. We made signals of distress. She perceived us, made for us, and take us all on board. There now, Monsieur Morel, that's the whole truth on the honor of our sailor. Is not it true, you fellows there? A general murmur of approbation showed that the narrator had faithfully detailed their misfortunes and sufferings. Well, well, said Monsieur Morel, I know there was no time in fault but destiny. It was the will of God that this should happen. Blessed be his name. What wages are due to you? Oh, don't let us talk of that, Monsieur Morel. Yes, but we will talk of it. Oh, well then, a rimance, said Penelon. Cocle, pay two hundred francs to each of these good fellows, said Morel. At another time, added he, I should have said, give them besides two hundred francs over as a present, but the times are changed, and the little money that remains to me is not my own. Penelon turned to his companions and exchanged a few words with them. As for that, Monsieur Morel, said he, again turning his quid, as for that. As for what? The money. Well? Well, we all say that fifty francs will be enough for us at present, and that we will wait for the rest. Thanks, my friends, thanks, cried Monsieur Morel gratefully. Take it, take it, and if you can find another employer, enter his service. You are free to do so. These last words produced a prodigious effect on the seaman. Penelon nearly swallowed his quid. Fortunately, he recovered. What? Monsieur Morel? said he in a low voice. You send us away? You are then angry with us? No, no, said Monsieur Morel. I am not angry. Quite the contrary. And I do not send you away, but I have no more ships, and therefore I do not want any sailors. No more ships, returned Penelon. Well then, you'll build some. We'll wait for you. I have no money to build ships with, Penelon, said the poor owner mournfully, so I cannot accept your kind offer. No more money? Then you must not pay us. We can scud like the pharaoh under bare poles. Enough, enough, cried Morel, almost overpowered. Leave me, I pray you. We shall meet again in a happier time. Emmanuel, go with them and see that my orders are executed. At least we shall see each other again, Monsieur Morel, asked Penelon. Yes, I hope so, at least. No, go. He made a sign to Cocle, who went first. The seamen followed him and Emmanuel brought up the rear. Now, said the owner to his wife and daughter, leave me. I wish to speak with this gentleman. 
and he glanced towards the clerk of Thompson and French, who had remained motionless in the corner during this scene, in which he had taken no part, except the few words we have mentioned. The two women looked at this person, whose presence they had entirely forgotten, and retired, but as she left the apartment, Julie gave the stranger a supplicating glance, to which he replied by a smile that an indifferent spectator would have been surprised to see on his stern features. The two men were left alone. "'Well, sir,' said Morel, sinking into a chair, "'you have heard all, and I have nothing further to tell you.' "'I see,' returned the Englishman, "'that a fresh and unmerited misfortune has overwhelmed you, "'and this only increases my desire to serve you.' "'Oh, sir!' cried Morel. "'Let me see,' continued the stranger. "'I am one of your largest creditors. "'Your bills at least are the first that will fall due. "'Do you wish for time to pay? "'A delay would save my honour, and consequently my life. "'How long a delay do you wish for?' Morel reflected. Two months,' said he. "'I will give you three replied the stranger. But, asked Morel, will the house of Thompson and French consent? Oh, I take everything on myself. Today is the 5th of June. Yes. Well, renew these bills up to the 5th of September, and on the 5th of September at 11 o'clock, the hand of the clock pointed to 11, I shall come to receive the money. I shall expect you, returned Morel. "'and I will pay you, or I shall be dead.' "'These last words were uttered in so low a tone "'that the stranger could not hear them. "'The bills were renewed, the old ones destroyed, "'and the poor shipowner found himself with three months before him "'to collect his resources. "'The Englishman received his thanks with the phlegm peculiar to his nation, "'and Morel, overwhelming him with grateful blessings, "'conducted him to the staircase.' The stranger met Julie on the stairs. She pretended to be descending, but in reality she was waiting for him. "'Oh, sir,' she said, clasping her hands. Uh, "'Mademoiselle,' said the stranger, "'one day you will receive a letter signed Sinbad the Sailor. "'Do exactly what the letter bids you, however strange it may appear.' "'Yes, sir,' returned Julie. "'Do you promise?' I swear to you, I will. It is well. Adieu, mademoiselle. Continue to be the good, sweet girl you are at present, and I have great hopes that heaven will reward you by giving you Emmanuel for a husband. Julie uttered a faint cry, blushed like a rose, and leaned against the baluster. The stranger waved his hand and continued to descend. In the court he found Penelon, who, with a rouleau of a hundred francs in either hand, seemed unable to make up his mind to retain them. "'Come with me, my friend,' said the Englishman. "'I wish to speak to you.'" End of chapter 29 Oh, poor Mr. Morel. Monsieur Morel is one of those characters who I find myself feeling very protective of, the same way that I did the Mr. Lorry in Tale of Two Cities. Do you remember him? He was the one who was always apologizing because he wasn't a family man. He wasn't married. He didn't have children. He didn't really know how to do this. But he was, he was marvelous, and he did. And they're completely separate characters, but I find that emotionally I'm having the same kind of reaction to them. So, of course, seeing Monsieur Morel in this kind of distress, finding out that he is, in fact, financially ruined. But his initial response is, yes, but is the crew alive? It brings a tear to the eye of our phlegmatic Englishman. But it is also, of course, there to bring a tear to our eye. That is a moment that I would have said is very Dickensian, except that Dumas did it before Dickens. So I am now going to have to call everything that I think is Dickensian Dumasian, I guess. <laughs> I don't know what you call it. But there is no question that Morel is supposed to be someone who we both are sympathetic to and that we come to care for very much like Edmund had cared for him before. 
And now we have this Englishman who is, we can guess, Edmund Dantes, in another disguise. So we have Abbe Busconi and we have our English banker. Now, he's going systematically through and finding pieces of information. First, he had to find out information from Caterus in kind of a general t- sense. And then he's gone to the man who kept the records at the prison. And we've seen him lift several documents that may be of use to him in the future. But we've also seen him assuming all of, or at least everything important for now, of Monsieur Morel's debt. Which led me to think that when he finally shows up with Morel, he was just going to say, don't worry, it's all forgiven. Except he really can't do that because Morel would know something was fishy. And Edmund needs to be really super cautious right now. He doesn't want to give away his hand. He doesn't want to show everybody who he is. He doesn't even want to risk showing someone who he is right now. So the fact that he's only given Morel extra time, at first I was really kind of horrified by, but in retrospect, I started to think, okay, well, no, actually that makes a certain amount of sense. So, okay, I'm curious to see how it's going to play out. And importantly, we have now met the next generation of Monsieur Morel's family and These young people, as we move further and further into the book, start to play a larger role in the story. And so this is our our first introduction to them. But there is one other thing that happened in our first chapter today, chapter 28. There is a moment in the text where de Beauvue was saying, oh yeah, you can imagine that prisoner's look on his face when he realized he was getting thrown off a cliff with this enormous weight attached to his feet. So when de Beauvais says, I should have liked to have seen his face at that moment, Edmund's response is, it would have been difficult. And that, to me, sums up Dumas' version of humor throughout this entire rest of the book. When the Count of Monte Cristo, when Edmund Dantes, as the Count, is going to be funny, that's how he's going to do it. Incredibly dry, dark humor. It's going to pop up from time to time throughout the rest of the book. And this is the first, well, not quite the first, but it's the first really solid indication that there are going to be moments that are funny. Not funny, haha, but funny. <laughs> yeah, it would have been difficult for you to have seen Edmund's face as he was being thrown off the cliff. What with him being thrown off a cliff and all and mm, almost drowning. But then they go on from there. And de Beauvais says, it doesn't matter, I can still imagine it. And Edmund says, so can I. And that's when he clenches his teeth. I know I am a person who likes that kind of humor. I'm just kind of drawn to that kind of humor anyway. But Dumas has some of the best scattered throughout this book. And that was one of our, our first inklings of what's to come. <sighs> so thank you again so much for voting for Craftlet in the podcast awards. I really, really appreciate the annoyance and the time you took to do it. And to all of our listeners in Orlando, Florida, my heart goes out to you. I was in Tucson when Gabrielle Giffords was shot and my son lost his teammate on his baseball team. And I know what it's like to have something like that happen in the middle of your community. And I'm so sorry. All right, that's it for me for this week. Next week, chapter 30. It's a long one. It's a good one. And I will talk to you then. Take care. Have a great one. Bye. If you like getting free audiobooks with benefits every week, please consider supporting the show over at patreon.com slash craftlet. There are rewards waiting for you beyond, you know, the free podcast. You can also subscribe to our premium streaming audio by tapping the red lock when you are looking at the app or at the show notes at craftlet.libsyn.com slash podcast. You can also sign up for a premium download subscription by following the links in the right-hand sidebar at craftlet.com. And if it's easier for you, you can always subscribe and review at iTunes and at Stitcher Radio. Like us on Facebook, support us at Patreon, and come with us on tour. For nine years, Craftlet has been kept going by the support of you, the listener. And for that, I am truly grateful. And remember, if your hands are too busy to pick up a book, at least you can turn one on 